It is Throwback Thursday, and I'm so excited to be sharing this with you. We're launching a new segment here on CBSN called The Way It Was. The Way It Was. We're going to be looking back at stories from this week in history, powered by the incredible archives at CBS News. So this week, spanning from January 4th to the 10th, we're going to go back first and look at the famed blizzard of 1996 that crippled the Northeast for days. Terror on the ice, the bizarre attack on the Olympic ice skater Nancy Kerrigan, and the story behind that nefarious plot. And straight out of the 80s, America got hooked on the portable phone. Let's first kick it off 20 years ago this week. So people spent days digging out following one of the worst blizzards in U.S. history. The storm struck on January 6th and buried major cities in the Northeast. Snow drifts in central, in certain areas, ranged from three to four feet tall. Look at those people digging the snow out of there. Look at the numbers, 30 inches in Philadelphia. Now, while New York City took a punch, it was Philly that was hardest hit. They got more than 30 inches, 154 people died across the area, and it caused $3 billion in damages. This blizzard consistently ranks as one of the most devastating winter storms ever to hit the Northeast. Well, two years before the blizzard, there was another disaster on ice, but this one was entirely man-made. On January 6, 1994, the sports world watched in horror as Olympic figure skater Nancy Kerrigan, there she is on the left on that Newsweek cover, was attacked after a practice session at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships in Detroit. Newsweek and the Daily News ran Kerrigan on their covers with the words she screamed after the attack. Why me? It was really horrific when I remember watching that. I just graduated from college and I remember seeing her and she was really in pain and that look of, of pain and horror on her face was exactly, it was so legit. Um, and here's what happened. A man clubbed her in the right knee in what became known as the whack heard round the world. Here now is the initial 1994 report filed by Jacqueline Adams from Detroit. Champion figure skater Nancy Kerrigan held back the tears as she told reporters a swollen knee will keep her from competing tonight at the U.S. Figure Skating Championship. I'm okay. I'm pretty upset and angry that someone would do this, and I really want to skate today, but the doctors all said I shouldn't. A still jittery Kerrigan said she never got a good look at the man who attacked her after yesterday's practice. All she felt was one real good whack on her right knee. I turned around and when I was turning I saw um, just someone was running by me and, and he just like whacked me with this long black like stick and it was really hard. Kerrigan won a bronze medal at the last Olympics. And after winning two big competitions last year, she was considered the favorite for a gold medal at the upcoming Olympics. Doctors say there is a chance her knee could heal quickly enough for her to compete at Lillehammer next month. Neither Kerrigan nor her parents, though, could understand how or why anyone would want to harm her. I have no idea. I don't think this way. I don't think violently. And I don't know how I could ever explain I mean, I don't know if anyone could figure out why someone would do something so vicious. I can't believe that one human being would deliberately, deliberately hurt her. Kerrigan's attacker is still at large, but Detroit police say they have at least one good eyewitness and a description of the man. Other skaters warming up at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships today were glad to see an increased police presence. They've added a lot of security guards, and that's helps, you know, people feel more secure, but um, nobody understands how the guy could get away. Kerrigan is the third female figure skater to be threatened or injured in the last year. Tonya Harding pulled out of an event a year ago November job, after the rink axle. received a bomb threat. A man who sent Katerina Vitt obscene and threatening mail was convicted of harassment. Although tennis star Monica Sellis was stabbed in the back by a deranged fan, fears like that had never entered Kerrigan's mind until yesterday. The big question now, of course, is whether officials will select Kerrigan for the U.S. Olympic team despite her failure to compete tonight. That decision won't come until tomorrow. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, Detroit. All right, now this story would become one of the strangest in sports history. So it turned out that the plot to attack Nancy Kerrigan was hatched by Jeff Galuli. 
He was the ex-husband of the figure skater Tanya Harding, who if you blinked and you missed it, she was in that package. She was also Nancy Kerrigan's main rival. The idea here was to break Kerrigan's legs so that she wouldn't be able to compete against Harding at the upcoming 1994 Olympic Games. And a lot of people couldn't even understand why that happened because Tanya Harding was a legitimate force in the figure skating world. She had landed a triple axle in 1991 at the U.S. Championships. She was an amazing figure skater. And this became a complete media sensation for weeks to come. Now, Tanya Harding denied any involvement, but did ultimately plead guilty to conspiring to hinder prosecution against her ex, who ended up spending time in prison for the crime. Harding and Kerrigan both made the 1994 Olympic team. Nancy Kerrigan fully recovered, went on to win the silver medal. Harding was eventually, though, banned from U.S. figure skating for life over the incident. All right, let's move on. This Week in History had some other interesting stories worth noting. On January 4, 1982, America's first test tube baby left the Virginia hospital a week after being born through in vitro fertilization. Fertilization, I'm going to say that right. This process was a medical breakthrough, and in 2012, now more than 60,000 babies have been born through IVF in the U.S. As for that baby, her name is Elizabeth Carr. She's now 34 and has a child of her own. All right, across the pond now, cameras captured Princess Diana getting into her car on January 4th, 1996, as reports surfaced that she was ready to negotiate a royal divorce. Months later, in July of that year, her split from Prince Charles was finalized. And the White House had a new resident in 1998. And we're not talking about POTUS, we're talking about Sox the Cat. Then President Bill Clinton introduced Sox to Buddy the Dog. Look at this, outside the White House for the first time. <laughs> Look at Sox with her back up in the air like that. Sox was hissing at Buddy the Dog and the two famously feuded over the years. It's such a big deal that when Buddy passed away in 2002, the New York Times obituary headline read, Buddy, Sox nemesis, is dead. <laughs> All right, turning now to the year 2007, the year, the day was January 9th, and an announcement from San Francisco would change the world and your life forever. Here's Daniel Seberg. Call it the latest case of gadget envy. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Naturally, the iPhone includes the music and video features from its iPod cousins. More than 70 million of them have been sold since 2001. But now there's much more. Global positioning, Google mapping software, web surfing, email, and oh yeah, a phone. What's the killer app? The killer app is making calls. <laughs> It also has something called visual voicemail, so you no longer have to check each message before skipping or deleting it. Jobs decided former Vice President Al Gore was worth listening to. I wanted to say congratulations on the iPhone. It is unbelievably cool. And look, Ma Bell, no buttons. You let your fingers do the walking on a touch screen. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. It works like magic. Some analysts are wary of Jobs' lofty claims. After all, Apple isn't the first to offer an all-in-one device. But after the success of the iPod, you can't underestimate the power of that shiny logo. It's tough to put a price on cool, but the iPhone is going to cost you at least $500 starting in June. And while the iPhone could be considered a true multimedia device by combining all of these things in one, you're only going to have one choice when it comes to your wireless carrier, and that's singular. Daniel Seberg, CBS News, Las Vegas. I love how in that story, Daniel puts all these other competitors out there that have similar devices. Trio, Palm, where are they now? If 2007 and that first iPhone seems like it was ages ago, prepare to have your mind really blown with Charles Osgood's 1985 report on the rise of the portable phone. Something can happen to you on a walk through the woods today that could not possibly have happened even a short time ago. Your telephone can ring. And the caller can be someone who's either thousands of miles away or thousands of feet up. Hello, Sam. You're not gonna believe this. Yes, Sam, you better believe it because there's a telephone revolution going on. And pretty soon, 
Nobody will have to hunt for a phone booth or wait in line to use one. We will have portable phones of a size that we can carry on the wrist or, or whatever by the next decade. Already, there are telephones where we never had them before. In Chicago today, you can make a call from a taxi cab. I'm in, uh, on my way to the airport. And once you get on the plane... Hello? You'll never believe where I'm calling from. Thousands of people are putting cellular phones in their cars, and the phone companies brag that they're not only indispensable, but indestructible. It's not a total loss. The phone still works. All this telephoning means, of course, that no matter where you are, you can always get a busy signal. Telephone rush hour. Busy, busy, busy. Then there are the new portophones. All you need is a pocket to carry them in. Now, this doesn't plug in anywhere. It doesn't have a, a unit that you carry around with it? No, this is entirely self-contained. It does cost an arm and a leg for one of these, $4,000. But the price is expected to come down, and cellular technology is spreading across the country. So that's why it's predicted we'll all have one one of these days. Well, that could be good. I can't find Dexter's number, and I got to get to him by three. But it also means that people who like to call you can do so whenever they want. Guess where I'm at? I'm still on the airplane. In other words, there may be no escape. What if all we want is to just get away from everything? What then? No more can we use the golden excuse. Sorry, I wasn't near a phone. Charles Osgood, CBS News, Englewood, New Jersey. Hello. Hello, Charlie Osgood, please. <laughs> What's funny about that video is, first of all, the dude in the beard completely predicted like so many of the things that we have right now. And the other thing is people keep pulling out that brick out of their pocket as if it's, yeah, I'm gonna carry it around in my suit. It was, it weighed so much and it was so bulky that compared to what we have here, it seems like so long ago and it was for a lot of people. So the fun thing about these CBS News archives is you never quite know what kind of story you're gonna stumble upon while you're digging through some of those old tapes. And with that in mind, there is where we found this segment with our retro moment of the week. It's from a 1995 report on what we then called the hip new sport of snowboarding. You see these kids going down the hill and having fun. So we decided to give it a try. Oh, that's wild. I surfed when I was younger, and I thought that would help, but it doesn't. <laughs>